<laughs> hey, Steve. Hi, Greg. Uh, well, I already hear we have an audience today. Well, she's probably not going to stick around. All right. Well, that's, that's cool. <laughs> um, how's it going? It's going good. How about you? Good. Really good. Uh, love this weather. Uh, yeah. So uh, it's got, yesterday was like almost 100 degrees. Today, it's like low 70s, maybe mid 70s here in Northern California. It's unbelievable. Overcast. Perfect spring day. Yeah. I'm muggy. Is it good for watching? Is it good for birding? It was pretty good this morning. It's it's kind of the um, the tail end of migration here, but I, I got a few migrants out there and stuff was singing pretty pretty late in the morning, so it was pretty good. Cool. All right. Well, as we start every show, uh, what are you drinking? Today, I kind of reverse engineered this one, but it's a Dragon's Milk White. It's mm. a bourbon barrel aged white stout from um, New Holland. New Holland Brewery in Michigan. Is that a coincidence with SpaceX Dragon going up just a few minutes ago? Oh, did they reschedule that to today? Yeah, it just went. It just it was awesome. Oh, I didn't. I didn't even know that. Um, yeah. No, it's actually. Uh, I knew what what I wanted to talk about today, and this was the closest I could come. Oh, on the beer show. I like it. So a yeah. little, a little, little foreshadowing on what's about to go on. Yeah. That's great. Well, thanks for asking. What I'm drinking today is... Hey, Greg. Um, oh, yeah. What are you drinking? Oh, what I'm drinking is a Telltale Heart Pale Ale. Mm. And, uh, of course, it, there's a, the coolest illustration of Edgar Allan Poe and a couple of crows on the front, if you can see that. So, so did you get it for the crows, or is this foreshadowing of the ant stuff by Greg? No, it's not. But okay. I just thought it was, I thought it was good for the show. Uh, it's from uh, DeClaw Brewing in Baltimore, of course, since the Edgar Allan Poe uh, Raven beer, Telltale. But there's a bunch of cool little things on the bottle. Uh, there's a little quote that says, it never skips a beat. Um, and then how about this, 7.3% alcohol. Nice, so, that's pretty good. This is, this is six, so not bad either. Yeah, all right, I'm gonna... Right, Not much of a head on this. <laughs> that, you talking about me? All right. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers. Mm, so how's yours? How's your drink? Um, it's pretty good. It's a little, um, it's got a little sweetness to it that might be, make it better for, for winter or something. That's, you know, white, uh, white beers temp. And is it, is it a Belgian? Is that, is it a white Belgian? It just says it's a, uh, a, wh a white stout, white bourbon stout. barrel aged. Yeah, this one's kind of nutty. It's uh, it's not got the bigger IPA tones to it. It's more like a Belgian um, kind of Chimay, Chimay red is uh -huh, what I would uh -huh. equate it to. It's delicious. I like cool. it. Cool. All right, so let's get to it. What are we talking about today? So I'm going to paint a brief picture for you to uh, kind of set you up for this. Okay. But um, we're gonna be talking about an aerial predator and its head is composed by about 70% is composed of his eyes. It has four wings. It can accelerate at 4G and when it's chasing prey, it can, when it's turning, it can hit 9G. Okay, wait a minute. You lost me on a couple of things here. One, I know that that the uh, ocular cavities of the avians are big a lot of times, so they could see really well. But did you say four wings? Four wings. Four wings. Um, Five eyes, too. What? What are we talking about? Are we talking <laughs> about a bird? It's not a bird. Not oh, a bird. okay. So you got me right there. You really got me. <laughs> I figured um, we, we were pretty good on birds for a little bit. And you, so it's, a, I'm going to go dragonfly then. Dragonfly, you nailed it. Oh, man, you really, you, you know, <laughs> usually you give me some sort of heads up if it's not going to be a bird episode for bird drag <coughs> that we're going to, you okay? You need me to pat yeah, you on I, the back? Yeah, I got some, some dragon's milk down the wrong pipe. <laughs> Want me to pat you on your little back? <laughs> um, no, I'm good. 
Uh, I love dragonflies. Not to be confused with damselflies. Right. So we're going to be talking about the common green darner. The common green darner. It's darner. It's named, how do you, how do you spell? Darner. D a r n e r. Like uh, so, it's darner. named after a darning needle because of okay. the shape of its body. It's interesting okay. you brought up the not to be confused with damselflies because a lot of people don't know, but there's a really easy to way to tell the two apart, <clears throat> the two groups apart. Yeah, you, you, you lift their skirt up. Well, that's one way. Okay. Um, but the other way is if you don't want to be that forward is <laughs> dragonflies, they hold their wings straight out to the side. Mm. Damselflies keep them back when they're mm. just at rest. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm, mm -hmm. dead giveaway right there. Man, the without, without getting the harassment <laughs> suit on your hands. Yeah, yeah, it happens. Um, the, gosh darn, the damselflies love my pool. Oh, I love they, love, they love visiting me in the pool. So I'm excited to, uh, and, uh, and really those stats were pretty dramatic at the beginning. Yeah, um, really dramatic. I see them as being um, kind of loafy. Like I don't see them as being like quick, you know, we talk about hummingbirds hmm. and stuff. So, all right, so let's get into it. Why did you pick <clears throat> the, uh, what was it? The, the what green darner? Common, common green darner, the or common, just some, some people just call it the green darner. The green darner. Um, how is there not a superhero? That, the green, the green that's darner. a great idea. The green darner. Maybe yeah. because it's too close to the green lantern. Um, fuck that guy. I don't know. He's, he's pretty impressive, though. Yeah, I yeah, I don't like him. All right. Um, lay it on me. So why'd you pick the common green darner? Um, you know, it's just getting to be that time of year. We're uh, seeing a lot, you know, around this time of year, flying around and, mm -hmm. and uh started learning a little more about them and and they're they're one of our most common dragonflies in north america and they they cover almost the entire continent and and uh so you know i think it'll apply to a lot of a lot of our audience and and uh they're they got some pretty neat neat characteristics that we'll we'll get into all right so paint the picture again like you you gave the dramatic the, but but describe this guy from from head to toe um, and what we're looking for size wise and everything else. Yeah. So this is one of the bigger dragonflies in North America. Um, there are, there are a couple bigger species, but it'll get three, three and a half inches long. I know that doesn't sound like much, but uh, that's pretty big as far as dragonflies mm -hmm. go. It, interestingly there um, in the, you didn't use the metric system, you decided not to go metric on this one. Yeah. Yeah. We're, we're, cause it's just a North American species. Oh, okay. Well, that's fair. I like yeah. that. <laughs> of course, we're leaving Canada out, I guess. Don't get me started on Canada. <laughs> we but, talked um, about toonies and loonies early, you know, on an early episode. Right. Yeah. All right. So uh, there, there are dragonflies in the fossil record that are uh, like 30 inches wingspan. So, but these, these ones aren't that, quite that big. So they're about three and a half inches or so. Um, Wait a minute. 30 inch wingspans? 30 inches. Yeah. God, that'd scare the piss out of me yeah so dragonflies they've been around for for uh over 300 million years and really they haven't changed much like obviously they they're not 30 inches anymore but functionally like they're they're nearly they don't have any major evolutionary changes in in 300 million years it's it's they, they got it right a long time ago and and have just stuck with it and been pretty darn successful wow all right. So, so they're, that's about their size. And then, you know, they got those big eyes that are, um, you know, they kind of take on the color of their environment to some degree, but they're kind of typically a little bit greenish, bluish. And then they have, uh, so that's their head. In the middle of their eyes, they have like a bullseye pattern if, if they ever slow down enough for you to see it, which is pretty cool. And then in between their big compound eyes, they have three little eyes that are, are really hard to notice. And they're, they're called ocelli and they're, they're just simple eyes, so they only really pick up um, light, changes in light. Um, the other are the compound eyes that, that can see color and, and all that kind of stuff. And then they have uh, uh, some chewing mouth parts that they can chew up their prey with. So then behind their head is their thorax where the wings and the legs are attached. And the thorax is a really, it's one of my favorite shades of green, actually. It's kind of a, a yellowish green, um, but really, really pretty kind of a, emeraldy green mm -hmm. i guess mm -hmm. and then the males and females are a little bit different so behind the thorax is what 
you might think of as the tail of the dragonfly, but it's really in insect speak, it's, it's their abdomen. And the male is a, a really brilliant turquoise blue on most of it, although it's, it's kind of black on the top, but a really neat turquoise blue. And then the female's a little duller, it's kind of a rusty brown, sometimes purplish, and, and just, just more subdued than, than the male's really turquoise blue abdomen. Um, uh, kind of cool. That, and so with your naked eye, you could tell a male from a female? Yeah, most of the time. There, there are occasionally females that, that have uh, a blue coloration, but for the most part, you know which, if you're looking at the male or the female. Um, and so lifespan, how long do these guys live? So they, we might want to get into their life cycle to talk about that a little because as, as you probably know, dragonflies start their life in the water. And so... Nope, you got it. You, listen, you have to assume that I know that I'm a big dummy. Yeah. Because yeah. I'm a big dummy. I'm trying so to give you the... Let's I'm trying slow, to give you the benefit of the doubt. Let's slow the roll here. No, yeah. I did not know that they start like, like let's what? talk. No, okay. dude, dude, okay. dude, you know, if you want to ask me about the 1988 PGA Tour and stuff like that, you know, I could, I could go back there and tell you about that. But uh, <clears throat> yeah, no. All right. So let's, let's start slow. For okay. So let's get like in their me. life cycle. So yeah. the, they start out as, as um, the, the adults, they lay an egg. So the, the female darners, they have a, what's called an ovipositor, which it actually kind of cuts a slit into plant material that's just under the water level. They cut slits and then deposit eggs in those slits. And then the eggs hatch in there. The larvae come out. They're really small, like probably less than a half a millimeter. Um, and then they, they start growing and they, they shed their skin and go through several different instars. And how many larvae will they be? Um, so they, they, they lay the eggs either singly or in, in small groups of two or three, and, and they, but they'll lay hundreds of eggs right. um, okay. at, you know, for, in, their, in their life, which is usually just one, one breeding season. Okay. Um, so then the larvae, they're, they're pretty tenacious to uh, terrifying on their own. They have this, uh, <laughs> they have this kind of prehensile lower jaw that can shoot out and grab prey. And it's got these hooks and barbs on it to kind of snare the prey and they shoot it out and it draws prey back in. And they'll eat, they'll eat like tadpoles and little fish as they get big enough. Basically whatever is big enough or whatever they're big enough to get and then they, they can chew it up. So they don't need to actually, you know, some things need to kind of swallow prey whole like that, but they can chew, chew off pieces of their prey to eat it. So, so in my mind, what I'm picturing right now, have you seen Starship Troopers? No. And, no, never mind. But there's a thing called the brain bug. And the, it, you, this is what I'm imagining. I'm imagining <laughs> for you sci-fi nerds out there like me, I'm imagining the brain bug. And I'm imagining Neil Patrick Harris putting his hand on the, on the brain bug as this is how, just, just let you know. It because could be just like that. Describing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so then the, the, the larvae, they, or the nymphs, they call them naiads, but they, they spend anywhere from a few months to sometimes m multiple years in the water. And then they crawl up usually onto a plant or a rock that's out of the water and they bust out of, of their skin and it takes a little while, but they, their body kind of hardens up and they turn into an adult. Mm -hmm. And usually the adults um, don't live more than a few months. And then they, their main job is to eat, mate, and then die, basically. Really? So you're talking about a one-year kind of lifespan that, that goes on with these guys? Less than that for the adults, less, for sure. Less than that. Yeah, I mean, the larvae can, can live longer. So like, like the green darners, they, they will typically overwinter as larvae and then hatch out the next spring. Um, so, you know, maybe 10, 11 months in the water, but some, some dragonfly species, especially ones that are like high elevation sites mm -hmm. where it's, it's not a super long growing season or in the Northern United States, um, they can spend more than one year in the water before they hatch out into adults. So, so I, again, learning things the, so the majority of their life, is not lived in the in the stasis that that we see them as most commonly as these right. dragonflies. Yeah, yeah, they definitely spend more of their life underwater. Wow. Yeah. 
Um, and then so, go ahead, keep going. So the, uh, and another kind of interesting thing about the green darner and it, it kind of fits in, in this lifespan discussion because they have a, a few different strategies. So like the ones we have in California, they're, they're pretty typical. So they'll, they'll, you know, start hatching out of the water and, you know, as it starts to get warm, like April, May, June, and they'll spend, you know, you'll see them most of the summer. They may lay their eggs and it starts a new cycle. The larvae, uh, the naiads overwinter in the water and then hatch out the next spring. So that's, that's kind of your typical um, dragonfly life cycle. But the green garners, there's a portion of the population that does it a little bit differently. Um, and so they're, they're, they're populations that are migratory. And they'll, what they do is they'll, like, if they're from the start in, say, the northern United States, they will hatch out in the spring and then they will, um, I'm sorry, they'll hatch out in, and then migrate to the southern United States and they will actually breed down there, die, their larva will overwinter, hatch out in the spring, and then those newly hatched adults will migrate back to the northern part of, of the continent. How, what mile span are we talking about? So I think the average is about 400 miles, but, wow. but they, can, they can go further than that. Um, they actually have, they did a, dragonflies can fly, and they're so strong when they're flying that they can actually carry a lot of weight. A lot of times when they'll do, they do like radio transmitter studies, they're limited by the size of the radios that the animals can carry. Like if you're putting them on birds to see how far they go, it's hard to do it on small birds, but dragonflies can carry more than their entire body weight. So they could put radios on them and track them. And they actually tracked uh, one of them that flew uh, about a hundred miles in one day. Although for the most part, they only go a few miles in any given day. So if I'm the government, I'm thinking about putting some cameras on some dragonflies then, right? Like this is like sci more sci-fi stuff. Like well, it, this is like, I mean, per just perfect. Train these I, guys to go in over the borders and take care of some business, do some spying for them. Yeah, I mean, I think they have some uh, some drones that they kind of modeled after dragonflies and hummingbirds and things like that. So yeah, okay, we have to have a we have to do a drone episode at some point as well. I'm obsessed with drones. I'm obsessed with. I, I mean, I wanted a model airplane when I was a kid so bad, and a and and a, and a remote control helicopter was just a dream back then. I mean, yeah. there was none none of this drone business. Oh. I was like bunch of bs they do that but you have you ever see those amateur guys flying their planes you know yes, they, yes. You know, the creepy guys in the middle of the schoolyard on a, on a <laughs> sunday <laughs> with their plane buzzing around and then kids of course flocking to this yeah pervert yeah <laughs> um all right so uh back to uh the green darner um so hundreds of miles super strong um but so so going back to that migration story like yeah like, so most of the population doesn't migrate, but the ones that do, if it's, it's the other thing that's amazing about it is that it's these young dragonflies that just hatched out. They migrate North having never, you know, they're not following anyone. They're not, they just, they just go, you know okay. I mean? It's just like, uh, they, they don't, they don't know how to get where they're going. They just, they just get there. It's, you know, it's so they crazy. We, and we don't know the reason they're doing that, or we do know the reason that they... Well, I mean, it's just, just a, a different strategy that, that evolution led it to was, you know, they were able to, you know, become successful doing that. But, um, you know, they're taking advantage of, of breeding in, in both the, the southern part of the United States and, and the northern. So dragonflies are typically tropical species, but there are some, you know, that are, that are throughout North America. And, and so they're either living as naiads underneath the ice during the winter in the water and they don't really grow that long and they're, you know, they're susceptible to freezing and things like that. Or, or these ones have found a different way around that to migrate and then have a different generation in, in a warmer area and then migrate back and have a generation up there when the conditions are, are, are good for them. I'm just assuming, but there's Asian dragon. I mean, it, it seems like that's a symbol in Asian culture, a Asian dragonflies, European dragonflies. Yeah. I, I think they're pretty much everywhere except except uh, 
um, probably Antarctica. And, and I, think, I think there have been sightings of dragonflies in Iceland, but wow. I, I don't believe that they uh, breed there. Yeah, there's, a, there's about 5,000 species worldwide. And I think uh, maybe about four or 500 in the United States. Wow. Awesome. Um, very cool. What else you got for us? You got any more facts to lay on so, us? So they're, uh, they're cold blooded animals. So, um, they have a few different techniques to kind of regulate their temperature. Um, as you know, it gets really hot here and some of their places it gets really cold. Um, so if it gets really hot, they become quite a bit less active and sometimes they will actually dip into the water to get water on them to, and cool by evaporation that way. Hmm. Another thing they do is uh, they'll perch on, on some vegetation and they'll point their, their abdomen or what you might think of as their tail straight at the sun so that the sun's only shining on the very end of their body oh, that's cool. instead of their entire surface area so they, they don't get as warmed up. And then so, they're smarty, just, so they're smarty pants. Well, something like that. I'm not yeah. sure if it's, you know, if it's what's, what's going seems on in the brain. Damn, seems pretty damn smart to me. I don't know how to get out of the sun. <laughs> Sometimes I just find myself with heat stroke. <laughs> and then if it gets cold, they can sit in the sun and warm up. They won't, they won't point at the sun to, to, you know, minimize the surface area. They'll kind of maximize it. But then they can also do the thing. And, and I know other insects like bees will do it. They'll, they'll just flap their wings really rapidly. And, uh, the, uh, heat, created by their muscles um, doing that exercise to, to just warm can them up. warm them up. So then they can become active and start feeding because really uh, an adult dragonfly, if they're not, if they're not feeding or, or trying to mate, then that's their only two real purposes in life. So that's, and that's to all entertain, to And do. to entertain us. Yeah. The third well, yeah. Purpose. I mean, that's, yeah. yeah. I mean, that's, that's one thing. Of and so then it's they're, like my they're purpose on life in life, Steve, just to entertain you. <laughs> To entertain me or everybody? Yeah. No, no, you specifically. Just me. Yeah, no, there's no one else even in the world. It's just you and I. Nice. Are you crazy? What are you crazy? So they do have a pretty elaborate kind of mating ritual they do too. So the the male on the tip of their abdomen, so on the very back end, what they'll do is they they typically patrol these territories where the females come through. And if a female comes through the territory, the male flies up on them, and on the back of their abdomen, they have these claspers and they'll hook them behind the female's head. <laughs> it's really romantic. Yeah. 50 shades of dragonflies. <laughs> yeah. And then the female, she like bends her, her abdomen up underneath and, uh, and they transfer the sperm that way. And then yeah. the, the male flies they... around with her so that no other males can mate with her before she deposits mm. the eggs and so then he's he's assured that his reproductive efforts are the ones that are are yeah. gonna you know carry on the species brilliant yeah. yeah and then they and then they get on the sex swing yeah and then they yeah. put on some berry white yeah so, so so they call that the uh the wheel position or the heart position because sometimes they form kind of like a, what looks like a heart but a wheel is kind of circular yeah yeah very well like berry white yeah Bow, 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 bow. Let's get it on like a dragonfly. I could hear it now. I could hear that, you know, being all the kids using it. So my, my fairy, favorite Barry White reference is from The Simpsons. I don't know if you remember the, the episode where they had the, um, the whacking day where they went out and tried to kill as many snakes as they could. Yeah, I remember this and, one. And, uh, Groundskeeper Willie. And, yeah. <laughs> and Lisa, of course, wanted to protect all the she snakes. Went, yeah. And so she put some very white tunes and put these speakers on the ground and it attracted all the snakes. I, I think she lured them into her house maybe. And then, and then whacking day ended and, and they were all safe. But <laughs> oh, so that, that's whatever I think of when I hear a very white. It's good to get some Simpsons references into the show again. Yeah. We, we, like, I, we haven't had a sim good old Simpsons reference in a, in a bit too. It's been at least a few episodes. Yeah. It's been a couple episodes. <laughs> we have to, we have to applaud the Simpsons. Yeah. yeah. Um, all right. What else you got? Is there any, is there anything else? Um, no, I think that's, yeah. I think we pretty much covered it. I mean, pretty good. Pretty good. Yeah. All right. You hear that? Oh, oh my gosh. Is that Martin again? <laughs> that's it. That's it. Oh. Yeah. Um, 
what do you think of, what do you think of this now that you've got to listen to it again what do you think of the new uh transition to and stuff it's a it's a bass it's a bass solo it's a bass solo i got i think the mix might have been a little rough on that one i think i might need to, to work on it but uh let's play it one more time all right it's time for so, and stuff everybody so one thing I got to get it squeeze in here is about the bass. So I have a, a really good friend who, who plays the bass and he had actually been talking about, you know, recording some, some music for us and stuff. And I just kind of blew him off. Cause I mean, let's be honest, it's the bass. It's the bass. I mean, there's not much use for it really. So he's, he's going to be super mad when he hears the last episode. Why? He might, because I didn't ask him to do it and someone else did it. Wait a minute. I think we're confusing who created that bass rift. No, no, no. I have a different friend. Another friend? What are yes. we talking about? You have two bass playing friends? Yes. Well, I mean, let's have a bass off. I mean, this is pretty easy oh, solve. He would be all into that. Yeah. You know what? I mean, I like the track. Am I married to it? I don't know yet. Oh. Like, like let's see like what so friendly else competition. Has. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. All right. You know what? This is this is going to turn around cuz I was pretty sure he was never going to speak to me again, but after he hears this, I think he'll be back. I you know what? I I want to, you know, welcome this competition. Yeah. No, it's it. not, nothing like a sexy bass to to, you know, wake us up. See, right. where I see problems, you see opportunities. Yeah, no, I see I see nothing but opportunity. Yeah. No, and it's the start of a great uh movie where these two bass players uh you know it's like cross the movie crossroads with ralph macchio do you remember this where he sells his soul you have no you god you really got to catch up to my references <laughs> it's, it's the simple story of the boy who goes down to you know to, to play against it's the devil went down to georgia story okay yeah but it's with guitar players with and now we have bass players now we have bass players i love it yeah um all right so today's and stuff um, I don't know if I ever told you this story. It got me thinking, we were talking about baseball and lack thereof. And I was listening to Howard Stern. They were talking about uh, Gary Del Bate throwing out the first pitch, which if you screw up the first pitch is now called a Baba Booey, right? Because he messed it up so bad. I threw out the first pitch one time at an A's game. Oh. And so this is, um, and I don't know the exact year now. I'm going to say it was 2004. Um, so quite a long time ago and we were doing work. My agency that I owned was doing uh, marketing work with a healthcare company in Northern California. And through that, because money is King, we had a big media buy and they offered like, Hey, um, would someone at the agency like to throw out the first pitch? And the gal who was doing the media buying said, do you want to do it? And it's like, are you fucking kidding me? Of course <laughs> I want to do it. You know? And I didn't realize then, and I do realize now that it would be so nerve wracking for some people that they wouldn't want to do it. Now, A's, they're one of the worst attended baseball teams in the country and always have been, right? So I'm gonna guess there might've been like 12,000 people. It was a weeknight. I drove down there with my brother, Steve, and my two kids, my older kids. And uh, they were like, I'm gonna say they were eight and six or seven and five, something around there, they're young. And uh, our friend, Mike Martin, met us there at the game uh, to do it. And I got to go down on the field, but the thing here is they, they don't let you warm up at all. They don't let you practice a pitch. And I know they do it on purpose. They, 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 they don't want someone to throw a great pitch. They want someone to screw it up, you know, really. So I'm down there and, um, and I'm trying to learn how to, you don't bring your glove, of course, if you're throwing a first pitch, this is not cool. You're not doing all these things. So um, I'm talking to, and it wasn't the catcher who, who caught the ball for me. It was the catcher's coach. Who, who caught the ball and we were talking beforehand and he's like, um, he's like, how hard are you going to throw this thing? I go, I'm going to throw it as hard as I fucking can because that's the spirit. That's what you do. He goes, just throw it as hard as you can. I'm like, Oh, great. So I get out there and they, and they're like, no, from uh, Marion Carson, Greg Carson, you know, and they did the announcement to throw the first pitch. It was really cool. And um, it was like midsummer. So it was still light out. It's like seven 30, but it's still kind of dusky out. It's not like dark out or anything. So, and I get out there and I'm about to step on the mound. And uh, the person with me grabs my arm and goes, oh no, 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 
you don't get to step on it. And I'm like, whoa, no, I want to go. And I argued for what felt like a minute, which was probably five seconds. And I actually <laughs> argued with this poor gal. And she's like, no, that's not how it's done. Like, you're not going to do that. So I get up there and I look at the, and, and I stand, and I actually get in a stretch position. I pull it close and I roll my hand over like I'm going to throw a curveball <laughs> in the warm ups. And the guy, God bless him, the guy who was catching me laughed out loud and did it. And I did not throw it as hard as I could, but I threw it. I mean, I did throw it and I yeah. got it to him. I didn't bounce it. I didn't make him stretch for it. I wasn't right down the pipe, but it was, it was a little uh, high and inside, but, um, but it was great. It was a great experience. And um, it was one of those things where at the time I just, you know, how many times and how many people are you going to get to to do this, right? 81 home games and, 30 teams. Um, and so it's, it's, it's pretty fun and pretty special. And I just, I didn't know if I'd ever told you that story. Yeah. Like 30 times. Yeah. I knew it. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, uh, before we get to what we learned today, we have to remind people to go to our Instagram. We mentioned it already. You were, you were on there earlier today and to email us with any thoughts, questions or advice or base riffs. So especially you, any, any, uh, species you got, you want us to cover. I yeah. mean, that'd be, Awesome to get some requests. I love it. Love it. All right. So uh, what did we learn today? We learned that the common uh, green darner is an aerial predator. That's how you started it. That's how you started saying. Um, they cover the continent. Uh, these guys are, are, are bigger comparatively to some other ones, three to three and a half inches. Um, in 300 million years of evolution, they haven't changed a whole lot. How am I doing so far? Pretty good. Pretty um, good. Five eyes, even though two of the eyes might be a little useless. Three eyes are useless? They have three eyes? You said they had five eyes. No, no. Three are the ones that just see light. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great. Okay. Yeah. So I was right. Um, and this, this is your quote, just so I uh, get it attributed correctly. Um, females are a little duller. <laughs> end quote <laughs> uh, that's, that's, i think i said that no i know you we'll go back i'll prove that you said that um those are the and i put steve's words right there <laughs> um i learned a word today naiads i naiads. learned the word naiads today how'd you spell it on your notes n-y-a-d-s okay so it's n-a-i-a-d-s oh okay yeah, I don't really, I'll never think of that word again. Um, they're super strong. Those are your words as well. They're super strong. Um, most of them don't migrate, but the ones that do, man, they can haul ass. They can go hundreds of miles, some of these guys. Um, and they have a wackadoodle mating ritual. They have the 50 shades of dragonflies. Sounds like you learned a lot today, Greg. I, you know, I did learn a lot today. I, I always, I got to tell you, I always learn a lot. Um, you know, it, what didn't we talk about today though? What's my favorite thing to talk about, but it's, we're going to keep it to the birds. We, we briefly we covered it, it, but it's not called the, it's not their clutch though. No. So the one thing though, after listening to you say that what we learned today, we might have to amend the, the first statement, which was that they are aerial predators to they are aerial and ravenous aquatic predators as oh, well they are man brain bug we talked about brain bugs today yeah yeah i'm gonna see i'm gonna i'm gonna youtube that maybe we maybe you could do a little thing on instagram about the uh larva and about how mean and vicious they are yeah we that's can, a good idea we can tease some people on that all right man um i think we think we did it all right i think we did the common green darner <laughs> you did it some real i mean you really gave it a little love letter i say this is uh, I, you know what i'd say this episode is a love letter to the common green darner i i got nothing but love for it yeah it seems like it i mean it feels like it definitely felt like it um all right buddy well i think we're gonna call it quits all right we'll have a good weekend <laughs> yeah you too, what's left of it right doesn't yeah it, yeah goes by too quick these days yeah all right stay out of trouble you too see ya